And rolling. Yep. Take one. Take two. Hey guys, Blake Calhoun here, and today's episode is a little bit different. I've done one of these before. I've interviewed a DP of a short film that was shot on an iPhone. It's a film called No Hard Feelings, and I got to see this as part of the Filmic Pro contest last year. The project was produced by some Australian filmmakers, and so I got in touch with them and arranged this interview. Before we get into it, remember, if you want to learn more about smartphone video and cinematography, check out one of my courses like the Complete Guide to Filmic Pro or Smartphone Cinematography 101 or my LumaFusion color grading course. Links to all these are in the description below. And so now here is my interview with director of photography, Dave Cleave. So the short, the log line for it is Rodney's crumbling ego is at breaking point and if his best pal Slim can't whip him into shape before his big day tonight, he might just lose it. She wants to come over tonight. That's fresh. Fresh. That is not fresh. I can't handle the humiliation anymore. I used to be like a rock. Give me one whiff and I would be pitching a tent. Now? Well, Rodney, we're not 20 anymore. It's, it's going to drop off eventually. Has yours dropped off? Yeah. Really? Not really. Hey guys, just wanted to jump in here real quick and say, wow, can you believe that was shot on an iPhone? To me, it's some of the best looking film style, movie style footage I've ever seen shot this way. So for No Hard Feelings, the decision to shoot on the iPhone actually wasn't mine. Uh, I came on board pretty late in the project and um, I'm really good friends with James and Paul, the two writers and directors and stars as well. And they asked me, you know, if I was free, if I'd like to come over and shoot something and they were planning to shoot it on iPhone. So I thought, you know, it sounds like a fun little rides and I'd never shot anything professionally on the iPhone either. So I thought it would be just a exciting challenge to undertake. So we shot it on a iPhone XS Max and also the iPhone XS. So they just sort of were interchangeable on set and what we had available. And we used the Filmic Pro app uh, to capture everything. So we paired the phones with the B-Script Mark II adapter, and that was actually really handy in allowing us more control over our image and, and actually being able to house the phone a bit more safely and being able to attach it to things like tripods or even attach it to gimbals and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it was really beneficial using the B-Script Mark II. I don't think we would have been able to do what we did without it. We shot the film on location in Changu in Bali, and uh, as a result of traveling internationally, we were trying to take as little gear with us as possible. So we didn't take anything like tripods or lights of our own. So we just had to rely on what we could source there. Um, so the tripod that we had for the first couple of days was just an old photography tripod and it definitely wasn't ideal. Uh, but then after a couple of days, we went to a rental house and managed to get a better tripod with fluid head and that sort of thing, which actually was a lot better for us to use. And also at that rental house, we were able to get a few uh, Dito lights and some C stands and some bounce boards and that sort of thing so that we could light some of the more glamour shots that take place during the night scene on his date. So we shot everything in Filmic Pro uh, at 24 frames and we used the log profile. We decided this because we knew that the iPhone's dynamic range was already going to be pretty average. Um, and so using that log profile at least allowed us to get just a little bit more room in the image so that we could grade it to the way that we wanted. And I think the results were pretty amazing actually. When I look at it myself, I struggle to feel like that that's an iPhone's image. And so I think it's pretty incredible what we were able to pull out of that whole system. So the two lenses that we used on this film were the Sigma Art 24 to 70 2.8 and the Canon 70 to 200 2.8 Mark II. We used those in con conjunction with the B Script Mark II adapter, and it just gave us a really good focal range of shots that we could get. And 
when you pair that with something like the iPhone, it all automatically just makes it feel like it's not an iPhone. Action. Rodney. I mean, being able to frame up zoom shots and get telephoto length shots and wide shots and that kind of thing was um, pretty amazing. We also had a couple of old manual Nikon lenses too, which were uh, we didn't use that often, but I think the main setup that we used that for was when we mounted the gimbal uh, with the iPhone. Uh, and so we had a follow focus also attached to the manual lens, and that just gave us a bit more control over being on the gimbal and still trying to you know, rack focus during a shot and that kind of thing. When we were using the electronic lenses, the Sigma and the Canon, the way we got around adjusting the aperture was basically we had a 5D uh, camera on set and anytime if we needed to adjust the aperture, we would just take the lens off the uh, B-script, we'd put it onto the 5D, dial in the aperture that we want, take it off, put it back onto the B-script and then our aperture is locked. So utilizing the B-script with those lenses and the iPhone, I'd say probably the challenges we faced were balancing of the rig. So obviously if you've got a 7200, it's quite long and heavy on the end of it. It just really gets a bit of dip going on. So getting your framing right and adjusting for that lean is quite difficult at times. And then we were just doing our best to frame up a shot, lock focus and not have to worry about doing any focus pulls or anything like that because as soon as you would start to turn the focus wheel you'd get a bit of shake and you'd get a little bit of wobble going on in the lens and it just wasn't a great situation for trying to pull focus. So the final output of our film uh, is, is somewhat in between 16.9 and 4.3 so we found that when shooting in conjunction with the B-Script adapter, uh, we never quite got a clean uh, full 16.9 image out of it because the edges of the B-Script adapter, the mounts right on the lens, always sort of had a little bit of a border to it. And we thought, well, we can try and figure some way around this, but the directors actually liked the aesthetic of that. They didn't want it to be 16.9, they didn't want it to be 4.3 either. They liked that sort of middle ground and it just gave it a bit of a different look because every time we would put the phone back in and realign it, or if we'd change over from the XS to the XS Max, we'd have to adjust the alignments, get the lens uh, right in the spot again for the base grip. So we ended up having footage that had different sort of levels of where that border sat in the footage. So when James was editing, he had to make his own version of that border so that he could just make it consistent throughout the edit. So that was somewhat forced upon us based on how the Beast Grip interacted with the phone. It somewhat matches the aesthetic and the vibe of that 80s grungy kind of feel that we wanted anyway. So it ended up working out for the best. Being able to have such a minimal uh, kit and rig that you can just sort of place anywhere is pretty amazing. I mean, even when it is paired with the base grip and a lens on the front, it's still quite compact and small. So it allows you to really get into places or be sneaky with your camera and that sort of thing. There were probably a few locations that we went to that if you rocked up in Changu with you know a big camera kit and that sort of thing, you'd draw a few eyeballs and a few sort of attention you might not want. But putting it through on the iPhone and just going in there, being able to get a quick shot, quick setup, you don't look like you're you know, coming with all this kit. It's pretty beneficial, I think. So that was really handy for a few of the setups that we had, because we were just running around Changu doing the best that we could to find locations and do everything sort of on the spot. So I think it was really handy for that. I think the other advantage is probably the fact that the iPhone is its own storage device. So not having to cycle through cards and keep track of that all day and you know, getting back to your computer at the end of the day and having to dump multiple different cards and all that sort of stuff. It's really easy just plugging in the phone, copy your files across, boom, you're done. So on location shooting, we had a few issues with the phone and the app overheating and crashing at times. Now shooting in Bali and Changu, the humidity is just off the charts and it's very, very hot there. So I'm sure that that wasn't a great environment for the phone to try and thrive and work efficiently in. I haven't tested using that setup 
in an environment that's not quite as humid and hot. So uh, it may not have been such a problem in another location, but certainly in Indonesia, yeah, it was a bit of a struggle. Getting exposure right was really tough because we found that shooting anything over ISO 100 on the iPhone started to get really grainy and noisy. And then to match the ISO level with the right shutter speed was pretty tricky because we discovered that you couldn't independently adjust the shutter speed and the ISO from one another. So I just wanted to point out that you actually can set the ISO and shutter independently of each other. And after I got this interview from Dave, I talked to him a little bit more about it. And so he sent me a follow-up clip. So actually in my discussions on email back and forth with you, Blake, you actually brought to my attention the fact that the shutter speed and the ISO can be locked and adjusted independently. When we were shooting this in uh, back in September of 2019, we didn't have a lot of time to really get to play with the app before we started shooting. We did a few tests and we tried to learn it as, as well as we could. But for the life of us, we were just unable to figure out how to independently adjust the shutter and the ISO from one another. And we did discover that shooting anything over 100 ISO wasn't super ideal, it got quite noisy and it wasn't super clean. So we're always trying to keep it under that. And because we couldn't figure out a way to independently uh, separate them, we found the frustrating part of trying to push on the screen to get a rough auto exposure within the app and then just hit and hope that it would give us the shutter value of 1 slash 48 that we were after as well as an ISO range below 100. And so now looking back on it, realizing that I could have just swiveled that line on the, on the app to get to 1 of 48 and then tap it and lock it and then adjust the ISO independently is pretty annoying to find out because we spent a lot of time um, mucking about with trying to get those exposures right on set. And uh, I feel like that would have actually saved us a lot of time. Um, so, oh well, lesson to be learned and I can take that forth next time if I do it again. So for the audio, we just recorded with two radio mics and also a shotgun mic on a boom pole. Uh, into a Zoom recorder. So for the crew, there was actually only five of us. So it was a real skeleton crew. And uh, we just had to make do with the guys that we had there and try and fill out the roles as best we could. Um, but credit to James and Paul for pulling together everything that they did and being able to make this film work with such a small crew, especially in an international location. So we actually shot for a week. So most days we would get a couple of scenes done here and there and then go back and prepare for the next shoot or go and hunt for locations or try and find some new gear that we could go and pick up. So it was a real mix of go into the morning, shoot a scene, maybe in nighttime go and shoot a scene throughout the day, try and figure out logistics of what we needed for the next few days. So we're all due to shoot this morning. What uh, what went? What happened? Well, we didn't foresee that there would be uh, places other side of us pumping music and using power drills. <laughs> How could we have known? <laughs> so we're gonna have to, you know, shoot again on Monday, which is the day before we leave. Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fine. So the way we did that was to mount it to the gimbal, we had to counterbalance it quite significantly because the way the beast grip works with the mount on the far left, once you've got a lens on there, the whole thing just tips to the side. So what we did was we had a custom weight made that we could, it was about that big or so, and then we just put some rubber bands around it and attached it to the other side to just get that balance back a little bit better. And then, yeah, we were able to mount it to a Moser Air 2 and I was then sitting on the back of a bike while I was pulled along and uh, filming some of the tracking shots of the two guys on their bike riding down the street. So that stuff looks pretty amazing actually and I'm really proud of that stuff and it was really cool that we could actually still mount all of that to a gimbal. Yeah, I was really happy with how it turned out. I mean, I think the images that we were able to get out of the phone are pretty bloody amazing. You know, when I watch it, it, it doesn't feel like it's an iPhone short. 
I was a little bit hesitant before we started shooting this because I'd seen other content produced with smartphones and they always just had that certain look to it that just screamed that it was still a smartphone. Uh, I don't know if it's the sharpness or it's just the way it renders motion and that kind of thing, but it just never quite looked right to me and I wasn't convinced that we'd be able to produce something that didn't look like it was an iPhone. But when I started seeing the dailies back and realizing combining the phone with the app and with the lenses and having ND filters on the end so that we could keep the apertures open and really still make it feel cinematic. Uh, it really impressed me, to be honest. Uh, and, and when I watch the film now, it's, it yeah, blows my mind. And there are some shots in there, especially that I just go, wow, I can't believe that's shot on an iPhone. So I hope that it, it gives a lot of people the, you know, the ability to go, hey, iPhone's pretty good. Um, it can do some pretty incredible things when it's paired with the right material. I mean, even on its own, it can do some great things, but yeah, when you really take it seriously and you put the time into getting the image right, you can produce some pretty amazing looks. Biggest thing for us was getting those exposures right. I mean, you can go out and you can just let it auto expose and that sort of thing, but that won't necessarily get you the best looking footage that you can get. It still might feel quite smartphone-like depending on how the settings are. I mean, if your shutter speed is cranked way up high, then you're always gonna be in trouble with the image. So learning to balance those technical aspects are gonna go a long way to producing a really great final image. And have fun with it. I mean, get different lenses, get different mounts, try and mount it to a gimbal, try and do anything you can with it. I mean, we had a lot of fun trying to learn the different ways that we could shoot with this thing. And having the footage come out the way it did, I mean, I'm really stoked that we took the time to try and do those different things. And I'm glad that we took the time to make sure those exposures and the ISOs and the shutter speeds were all correct for every shot. Because if they weren't, then it might not ended up as looking as good as it did. So that's probably the main thing is just try and learn it inside out, try and get some lenses and ND filters for it if you can, because all those things are gonna go a long way to helping you get the most cinematic image you can out of your phone. You know that girl I met the other night? Um, the, uh, the French one. Ah, we. Oui. Celine. Yeah, well, she's really cool and we hit it off. Oh, nice. Just want to say thank you, Blake, for having me and letting me talk about the process of making No Hard Feelings. I'm really proud of this film and it's been great to see the reception that it's had so far playing at a number of festivals and for it to look the way it does having been shot on a smartphone is pretty amazing and hopefully we can inspire some other creatives out there to get out and shoot some amazing content on their smartphones. Thanks a lot mate, see ya. And I would just like to say thanks to Dave for taking the time to do all this. I also appreciate the producers of the film providing me footage and letting me showcase this project. And right now this film is actually making the festival rounds, so it is not available to see online at this very moment. And because of the worldwide pandemic, not exactly sure when it will be available as they're going to continue entering it in film festivals, etc. But when it is available, I will be sure to post that on my Twitter page and or I'll pin a comment on this video. There was a lot more of this interview that I did with Dave, and so I've also created a podcast episode with this interview. Link for that is in the description below. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this behind the scenes look at their short film. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.